Great. Welcome everyone to our One Health session. Um, we're going to talk about something completely new, the pandemic. No, that's, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> but we're going to look at it from a One Health perspective today. Um, so I was going to start off um, just playing the short introductory video. Of course, the I was instructed to make a three minute video and I made an eight minute video. Um, so clearly I can't follow instructions, but um, just as a precursor for our discussion. So um, I'm gonna press play and hopefully the audio works. So let me know. Did that work? Could people hear anything? No, hmm. okay. Um, I wonder how that works. Because um, I share a video, but it doesn't share the audio. Isn't that interesting? Does your audio start right away? Does. So I'll press play again, and you can let me know if you hear anything. Is there anything? Yes. Um, if when you share your screen at the bottom, there's a little thing that says video, like on the left hand at the bottom, it says share your video and audio. Just, be, just before you press the, the um, it should be down in the left hand corner. Okay, let's see. Stop share. Ah. Yes. Look at that. Okay. I had this trouble before, so I know. thank you. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to try this now. Um, needs my computer needs permission to do all this. So if I press play, Did well. today we're going to explore the. Yeah. Did we now we can hear it. Awesome. Okay. So this is about an eight-minute video. I'll play that, and then we will come back um, to start our discussion. One Health approach with specific emphasis on the current pandemic. One Health is defined as both a concept and an approach. As a concept, it speaks to the interconnectedness of human health, animal health, and environmental health. And we can have things called One Health issues that arise at that intersection. As an approach, it is a collaborative effort of many disciplines working locally, nationally, and globally to attain optimum health of humans, animals, and the environment. So health along a, a broad spectrum. Foundational tools for One Health include systems thinking and transdisciplinarity. So these are not tools unique to One Health, but they're very important in the application of One Health. Systems thinking is essentially not just looking at a few little factors involved in the issue at hand, but thinking about all the interconnected elements and processes related to that issue to really get a fulsome understanding of the situation. Transdisciplinarity is when we bring together lots of different perspectives, different expertise, different roles, and together we can generate new knowledge and understanding for the issue at hand. One Health is frequently applied in the context of zoonotic disease or zoonoses. Zoonoses are caused by pathogens that can be transmitted from animals to humans and back again. Of all pathogens, about 60% or of all, sorry, of all human pathogens, about 60% are zoonotic, and approximately 75% of all recent emerging infectious diseases that have caused large human health issues um, were of animal origin. And this diagram just illustrates the range of different zoonoses that exist from termed here stage one, rate, as the example of rabies, where the animal is always required for transmission to the human. So rabies transmission occurs from an animal to a human, and there's no human to human transmission. But we can move all the way up into a precursor of the current HIV virus, which originated in animals, was transmitted into humans, and then evolved to sustain human to human transmission. And so if we think of our current SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent of COVID-19, it originated in an animal source, but now has sustained human-to-human -human transmission. So now pathogen emergence generally occurs when a variety of factors create to combine to create favorable conditions. And this can be a complex set of interconnecting factors that aren't 
obviously uh, linked to begin with. And so we know that many of the key drivers for zoonotic disease emergence include globalization, agricultural intensification, bushmeat consumption and other types of wildlife trade, climate change, land use changes such as urbanization and deforestation, and socioeconomic change. And there are lots of reasons why these factors may um, foster zoonotic disease emergence, including providing increased opportunity for wildlife, human and domestic animal contact, putting wildlife populations under increasing stress um, and thus shedding of pathogens, can also changing immune system function, and leading to transportation of pathogens to new areas with naive hosts. And the list can go on. In a recent study conducted by Allen and colleagues, they found that the greatest impact on emergence events included areas with high mammal biodiversity, large land use changes, particularly those associated with agriculture, and then areas with lots of tropical forests. So if we think about the current pandemic, um, we can look at some of these interconnected factors to begin to determine how the virus may have emerged. So although the emergence of SARS-CoV is still largely unknown, there are some interesting theories with mounting evidence. And we, we can explore some of these in this diagram. So we know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a combination between a bat coronavirus and another coronavirus, and that the reservoir is most likely certain species of bats, particularly horseshoe bats. Coronaviruses are not easily transmitted from bats to humans, so we know that we need some sort of intermediate host. Originally, it was thought to be snakes because of the, gen the genetic composition of the virus, but that's largely been disproven, and now the top candidates are the pangolin or the bamboo rat. And there are a few theories, one that the virus actually emerged in Wuhan, and another that it mer emerged in a different spot and was trans uh, transported into Wuhan. So if we look at the Wuhan theory, we know that there's a large population of bats in Wuhan, um, particularly around the Yangtze River Bridge, where there are lots of green and red lights to attract them and areas for roosting. This bridge isn't far from the seafood market where many of the initial cases were traced back to. And bats really like this market. They're attracted to the green lights. There's lots of insects for them to feed on and um, lots of areas to roost. We also know that this is an area of high wildlife species density. Um, many of these species are still alive, they're under tremendous stress, and so it creates favorable conditions for pathogen transmission. And so it's believed here that the virus could have been transmitted from bats, either directly to the intermediate host or via feces or other sort of excrement from the bat to the intermediate host. And then that intermediate host facilitated transmission to humans. The other theory is that this happened in another location, um, most likely Zushan, which is an area of high bat population, where there's also lots of different breeding colonies and breeding areas of bamboo rats for consumption. And this has grown over the last couple of years as a popular um, source of food um, for sale in these, these seafood markets. And so it was believed that transmission occurred here. These rats could have been transported into the market and then facilitated transmission to humans. Another thing to note here is that although we're looking at transmission to humans, humans can transmit um, back to animals. And there's a lot, several examples of this happening in cats and bink, but the species list uh, of potentially susceptible species is quite long for both wild and domestic animals. And it's these species that have that ACE2 receptor that allows viral virus entry into the cell. The other things that we need to consider here um, are some environmental conditions. This is an abnormally cold and dry year in Wuhan province, and this can really facilitate coronavirus survival. And it can also dampen human Im immune response. And so as we see, we have an interesting combination of factors that may have contributed to the emergence of SARS-CoV-2. What we can do is 
Let's look at all these intersecting factors and use our current pandemic, as well as previous pandemics, including SARS, MERS, Ebola, and think about them from a One Health perspective, particularly in the context of pandemic preparedness and prevention. And so that will be the focus of the session today. Okay, um, can everyone hear me again? Right, um, so now following sort of the introduction of the topic, there's an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so does anyone have any questions about sort of setting the context for our discussion before we get in, into the, the meat of it? <clears throat> Hi, my name's Allie. I was just curious, what makes a disease more likely to be retransmitted from human to human? Like, why do some get to that level where others don't? That's an excellent question. Um, and I'm not sure I <laughs> am the best person to answer that from. Um, I think there's a lot of sort of molecular things that happen that I don't, <laughs> I don't really understand. Um, Can yeah. I, can I add to that, Katie? Sure, absolutely. So uh, you alluded to some of it in the um, in your presentation, but I think a big one is mode of transmission. So mm -hmm. something like um, and and survival in the host. So mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it's droplet transmission, it's 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 a virus that again, for whatever reason, likely genetics, mutations, things like that, and coronaviruses tend to mutate quite effectively. Mm -hmm. um, that droplet transmission has emerged as a really key um, factor in the human-to-human -human transmission. I don't know if that's, that's helpful, but you look at something like... Um, you know, like rabies that you mentioned mm -hmm. that has a really high fatality rate um, requires, you know, uh, animal saliva to get in into your tissues. Um, that's not a very effective mechanism for an mm -hmm. agent to spread. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just one thing that I think has come out for coronavirus, but they're still learning a lot about it. Yeah, th thanks, Sam. That's an excellent answer. Um, Maybe if I don't focus on the molecular side, um, I got all freaked out there trying to think of um, a good molecular answer. But I think if we look at, <clears throat> excuse me, some other conditions pulling this back up, um, Sam had mentioned some really key things that we see that are characteristics of diseases that really have that potential. One is what happens in the host. And so something that kills the host off really quickly doesn't necessarily favor wide transmission because you sort of have a dead end cycle of transmission. The mode of transmission is really important. And then the type of pathogen it is. So certain pathogens, particularly, you know, if it's an RNA virus or something like that, they can undergo um, mutations quite quickly um, and change and evolve within the host will allow it to have that, that pandemic potential. Does that answer the question, at least sort of? <laughs> Yep, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Excuse me, I have one question. Okay, uh, Katie, and uh, uh, I wonder uh, what's the difference between limited outbreak and long outbreak? Thank you. Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? The difference between a limited uh, outbreak? Yeah, and a long outbreak. Oh, okay. Oh, you mean on this diagram? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so a limited outbreak is something that essentially you're still 
you still need the animal source for that exposure. And there may be a small amount of human to human transmission, but it sort of fizzles out in that human, in that human host. So there's not widespread transmission from humans. And so there's not very many cycles after that. And then there still needs to be exposure back to the animal host. And so another example, so the example given here is Ebola, um, but there have been some sort of larger scale Ebola outbreaks for sure, um, where you know, the exposure to the animal is the key source and there might be some ability for close contact depending on how the pathogen spreads for some of that human to human transmission. We've seen this as well with some of avian influenza where a lot of the really bad outbreaks have all been linked to poultry or avian exposure with maybe sort of really close family members that have been exposed and that human to human transmission happening, but not happening on a wide scale. And why that's really important is if we think about, you know, our current pandemic or a lot of people on a daily basis, most of us don't have contact with a lot of these species. If we think about the reservoir with where coronavirus may have come from, so bats and some of these intermediate hosts, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people in this world have never had exposure to that. And so if, it, if that pathogen never evolved to be able to go from human to human, it would have fizzled out really quickly. And so that's sort of always the scary part is when there's sustained human to human transmission because that sort of geographic, cultural, um, behavioral factors that um, facilitate transmission because there is animal contact are all sort of removed. So all of those barriers um, become non-important when we're thinking about transmission. Okay, thank you. But uh, uh, more question. And uh, now, how do you think COVID-19 and uh, it, it is uh, have the stage five or stage four together, mixed together? So I think um, based on what we know, it would be at stage five, that it's pretty, so I don't think necessarily exclusive human agent in this context. Um, there, we know that there's still potential human to animal transmission. I don't know if there's been many other investigations of back animal to then human. Um, I think there was some discussion on a, a big mink outbreak um, on a mink farm in the Netherlands about what direction transmission had actually happened because the mink were sick and the, some of the, the people handling the mink were sick. Um, but what happened first? And sometimes it can be really hard to then figure out sort of the chicken and the egg, um, especially when we know that there's asymptomatic carriers. Um, and so it can be hard to figure out if both are occurring or if right now we're particularly just seeing humans then transmitting it back to animals. But I think if we look on this diagram where we would be in, in stage five, you know, the, the reliance on animals for any um, sustained transmission is pretty much disappeared. Okay, thank you, thank you. I think we're probably getting near the end of our question period. Um, does anyone have any last minute burning questions before we sort of open up our discussion? All right, so hearing none, I'm just going to click ahead. So uh, the main question for this discussion period for every single group is what are the key implications for public health action? And so I wanted to put that up so that we continue to reflect on that question as we come back to our discussion. Um, but I really wanted to direct us into thinking about two separate aspects of thinking about the context of this pandemic and what we know, and then thinking more broadly as uh, conversations have already started to happen, but how do we prepare for the next one? Um, and I also wanted to open it up to thinking about actual prevention. Um, and prevention for the next pandemic. Because sometimes it doesn't seem like that necessarily, we talk a lot about preparedness um, and, and that argument I think comes from a lot that, you know, there are lots of viruses, there are new viruses all the time or any kind of pathogen um, and, you know, sort of the next pandemic is inevitable. 
But I think if we think about some of the key drivers that we've already been introduced here and think about disease ecology and all of these intersecting factors, there are certainly things that we may be able to change or should think about changing moving forward and be part of our pandemic process. Um, and I think a lot of that comes to light when we think about this from a One Health perspective and think about those intersections. So I wanted to sort of have two discussions. They'll probably sort of merge into each other, but the first one being based on current observations and using a One Health approach, what do we think are the key considerations for um, pandemic preparedness? And then reflecting on that, um, as we sort of discuss this, I want us to think about if we're building a One Health team and we're thinking about so at sort of the, the heart of One Health is collaboration. Um, who needs to be on, who needs to be part of these conversations? Who needs to be part of these teams um, to really have an effective One Health approach? And then the second part of the discussion is just, we're gonna replace preparedness with prevention. Um, so I think we have, Sam, correct me if I'm wrong, we have about 15 minutes for this discussion. I think uh, you're muted. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Just trying to move through multiple windows on a <laughs> screen. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we have um, 27 minutes remaining. And I think the last um, five minutes are to go over our top three to five points and okay. um, choose someone to uh, present those back to the group. And if there are no other volunteers, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'll put those points on a PowerPoint slide and that will be shared with the main room once we go back to the main room. Um, so yeah, we have about actually like 20 minutes um, to go through this discussion. So maybe 10 for preparedness and 10 for um, prevention. Excellent, okay, works. yep. And I don't, did you want to be able to put a slide up or were you going to do that near the end? Okay. Um, do people want to see, do you want to pr me to present the notes? I could screen share the notes I'm taking. But otherwise, I'll just try to capture the discussion. Okay. I kind of like your slide, actually. It's a nice visual. Okay. So I will, I'll put that back up then and then. Okay. So... Any initial thoughts? And it, it might be easiest to think about things from sort of your perspective or where you come from first, if we're thinking about this triad. And together we might be able to sort of bring out different perspectives from, from that discussion. It's um, Cheryl, oh, uh, Cheryl Van Dallen Smith here from York University. Hi, Cheryl. Hi. Um, I'm actually beside a pond, beside a rescued duck who lives with our rescue pig. So, um, <laughs> and thus I have no camera on. Um, you know, when I think about One Health and I think about who needs to be a, a part of these discussions, um, no surprise, I think we need to be thinking about animals and the way that we view animals and the way that we commodify uh, animals and justify that they're somehow here for humans. And, and, it, and in many ways, it just reinforces this hierarchy of, you know, um, animate nature over inanimate nature and then, you know, human animal uh, over non-human animals. And so when I think when I think about One Health, I'm drawn to it. Uh, that's the duck making noises. I'm, you know, I'm sorry, um, not very scholarly. I'm drawn to it because I just, I think until we actually think about the way that we treat animals and the way that we use animals, we're going to continue to have these zoonotic um, diseases. And I, I sort of get tired, you know, of being prepared for them and, and so want to just be way up the top of the stream and prevent it in the first place. So I know you want to move to um, prevention in a bit, but that's sort of where my head is at right now. I hope that's not um, taking you off uh, your plans. No, no. I think um, 
you brought up something that I wanted to eventually address and you address and you got to it right away. And so I think, um, so if we kind of look back into the history of One Health and, and even something that's quite pervasive today, particularly when we think about zoonotic disease, is that it tends to have a very anthropocentric, anthropocentric, you know what I'm trying to say, I struggle with that I do. Word, yeah. Um, yeah. view to it where, you know, animals are seen as risks and animals are seen as part of the system, but they're, they're not always viewed as um, something to protect and that needs to be that we, we want to maintain, you know, healthy animal populations um, f from sort of the disease perspective um, and think about that in the broader preparedness. And I think yeah. a lot of times when we start talking about zoonotic disease emergence and wildlife, um, people who have you know a lot of stakes in wildlife health and really want to fight for wildlife health we worry from the perspective that wildlife become a scapegoat and a blame perspective when really when we start to think about what happens in wildlife and what drives that crossover it's, it's not the wildlife's fault right and and so switching our view in one house to make sure that we're thinking which is is why i put this at the bottom that you know, it's not optimal health just for humans, but it's optimal health for humans, animals, and the environment because they're constantly intersected and we need to think about it from multiple different perspectives. So um, I'm really happy you brought up that point. Right. I mean, and our, you know, Indigenous uh, peoples, plural, have been telling us this and thinking this way for a long, 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 long time. And, you know, I find some, some applications of One Health maintain the hierarchy of humans over animals and animals over inanimate nature and and still in some ways don't want to shift the way that we commodify the planet and commodify the animals and and see and and don't truly see a connection unless it impacts humans and when i say it impacts humans it's only certain humans that people will get up in arms about you know i mean certain certain humans on certain continents don't get as much interest i guess so to me it's all about hierarchy and what's valued and that's why i'm in the school of nursing just so drawn to the aspect of one health and we're actually redoing our philosophy and mission in the school and one health is just central at york so yeah i'll stop there thank you Nate. it's ash i'm lani here i thought i could chime in um if i may yeah. um it was Gonna add that a lot of the factors that you spoke about earlier, um, you know, I work a lot with government and we regulate all of these things differently. So when urban planners are thinking about how the city is gonna look like and where we're gonna cut into forested areas, um, you know, the consideration isn't, oh, we're gonna release some, uh, you know, some, some bacteria or some viruses that may then transmit into humans eventually. Mm -hmm. um, or like when we're thinking about what goes into um, uh, wet food markets in uh, in in certain countries, um, you know, we're thinking about what food can we consume rather than like what may be the risks of exposure to viruses from that. So, uh, and often these these discussions um, happen in silos. You know, the health perspective in general is sort of an afterthought. And so, how do you like? I mean, you know, we've been talking about health and all policies or one health approach for a while, but how do we really make it front and center? Um, in the minds of policymakers and decision makers, that this is sort of a key consideration, especially given that this pandemic has blown it up in a way that it's now front and center mm -hmm. for everyone. That's an excellent point because we think, you know, when we talked about those drivers, there were certainly a lot of things that that are human induced, um, and I I had mentioned that you know it's not this obvious connection towards infectious disease emergence or things like that. Um, and I think we sort of, you ask a big, a really important question about how does this then become front and center? And those sort of considerations become part of wider conversations where maybe it's not quite as obvious. And I think that One Health has struggled in sort of that operationalization aspect where, you know, I think a lot of people will argue 
why it's so important and provide examples of where we didn't do it and we should have. Um, but making it front and center and making it sort of the default approach versus something that happens because we realize that we should have done it as an afterthought is really challenging. And I think part of that sort of starts by making sure that our teams that are working on things have broader considerations and that in, you know, we start having conversations with people who maybe aren't as obvious to have at the table, but bring in those perspectives and sort of um, start to, you know, build that One Health team and that One Health perspective. Not that anybody ever gets it right at the beginning. I always like to emphasize that is that, you know, there's no example out there of somebody doing One Health perfectly. But I think if we start thinking about, um, and maybe this is sort of a, a, a takeaway point or something when we're thinking about who's on our One Health team, that it includes, you know, broader people from, you um, a wide variety of disciplines and community representation and things like that. You know, not on every team, it, it can be hard for efficiency. Um, I'm starting to ramble here, but you bring a really good point. And I think sometimes one of the first steps is making sure that there are other perspectives that can bring in and ask some of those hard questions. I think, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying and I, um, it is a huge challenge. I think as public health practitioners in every, in every way, um, I wonder, like, I mean, I have had sort of political friends and non-public health friends ask me, you know, what, what should I be reading right now? What should I be understanding? And so I wonder if, like, we have a role to play in sort of informing uh, the broader public of, of things that, because people are now paying attention, like they want to mm -hmm. know. And so it's like, I think the onus is now on us as a, as a professional sector to um, draw attention and speak about these topics more openly than, than perhaps we would have in the past. Mm -hmm. I think you bring up a good point when it talks, you talk about people are paying attention. And what I'm starting to hear a lot of is people are getting, I don't know if the word's frustrated maybe, with the conflicting information, recognizing information is coming out kind of on the daily. But when it comes from a policy, at least government uh, driven, that there seems to be a lot of different approaches being taken, certainly when we look across the country. Um, I'm privileged to be in BC uh, on the island where we're doing exceptionally well. And so I think things are maybe a little bit more relaxed out here. Um, whereas colleagues of mine who are in Ontario, for example, are really seeing a different uh, reality. And so I think it's hard with the information that's going out there to keep people engaged and providing the information that they, they need. Hmm. So I think that speaks to the how do we become more prepared. Um, I think there needs to be some discussion of what the fall is going to look like and get people into that preparation. You know, we, we talk about earthquake preparation all the time, but how many people are actually prepared? If we go back to a, a state of quarantine or a state of lockdown, so to speak, come the fall, what does that mean for people? And are people actually prepared to, to do that? And, and sort of, how are we doing for time, Sam? Um, we have about 15 minutes left. So 10 okay. more minutes for discussion. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna, we'll probably shift over to prevention because I think they all kind of go hand in hand. But one of the things that I've sort of thought about, and this is from my perspective as a veterinarian and thinking about animal health um, more in, in detail than human health too, is that our preparedness and our response is very um, human focused as well, which of course there's nothing wrong with that. We wanna protect human life, but I think that there have been widespread animal health ramifications as a result to our response that maybe didn't, weren't thought of as widely, sort of from even companion animals and, you know, stress response and things that have happened within households and changes that have happened there. Of course, those are things that we can deal with, um, and but things we're learning about, all the way to um, impacts on supply chains and things like that to keep farm animals healthy um, and optimal welfare. And so um, 
maybe we'll switch into prevention, but we can think about that too in, in preparedness. Um, I know these are, these are very big concepts to address in, in 20 minutes. Um, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Katie, I was just thinking, um, this is Lori here. Um, as a veterinarian and thinking about this, that what, what makes it, I, I think about uh, the overcrowding that we see for um, like our food animals, like mm -hmm. for chickens, pigs, cattle. And it seems to me that that's just a cesspool of, of, uh, of virus potential happening mm -hmm. right there. And so that whole practice and, and potential abuse, I think, of, of these animals. Mm -hmm. But that's what, how we, our construction right now of how we, um, you know, how animals are, are brought to market. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times we see that overcrowding thing. So what's, mm -hmm. what are you seeing in terms of um, disease, in terms of those, like I'm, th I'm talking about prevention here on okay. your thing. Thing. like mm -hmm. how do we uh what is your you know what are you seeing as a veterinarian in in terms of disease in those kind of situations yeah and you know i think if we if we certainly look at some of the the past examples of where significant zoonotic diseases have emerged so um for example like nipah virus where bats were really close to intense um, agricultural um, production, particularly of pigs, which acted as an intermediate host. And then that was a huge driver for disease emergence. And you're right, that sort of really close contact, it's just like in high density human populations, right? We worry a lot more about transmission. Um, and, and that is certainly something that we see in animal populations as well. Um, I think I think rethinking our animal production systems has been a, a very difficult conversation. And sometimes it's almost like the elephant in the room when you, know, you talk about food supply and food safety, food security for a growing global population. Um, and then we bring in the context of animal welfare and disease transmission and climate change and the role that you know, intense industrial industrialization of of animals and the role that that has on greenhouse gas production. It's a it's a loaded issue, um, <laughs> and one that you know I think there are also a lot of really heated debates on. But I think if we think if we try and take your point, which is is a really excellent point, back into thinking about prevention that maybe one of the key things is for us to um, reconsider and evaluate our animal production systems in the wider context of disease emergence um, and uh, animal welfare as well. Um, we could talk about <laughs> this for the rest of the conversation for sure. Uh, and I think you bring up a really good point that needs to be considered for prevention. And, and sometimes the problem with really big things like this is that, um, which is where we sort of bring in One Health, is that you have this complex issue with so many different perspectives that need to be considered um, without an easy answer. But that does not mean that we can't look at it and think about it and and work towards a solution. We just need that, that buy-in to do it. And, and, you know, maybe this is the impetus that people need to rethink that. Katie, oh, can Kate, I? Katie, sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, sorry. I'm, my name's Kirsten and I'm, I'm out here in Manitoba. And I guess something that does this also this one health approach like you know we've been kind of talking about animals and humans and mm -hmm. somebody in the chat pointed out you know even in the animal um uh, slaughterhouses that you know they've had some outbreaks of covid mm -hmm. there as well and then i'm just wondering about the environment you know that um 
the pandemic's kind of helped us to see that, you know, we really can change our way of doing things, you know, that, um, and that we really can decrease our footprint, so to speak, you know, worldwide, because they've seen, you know, huge improvements mm -hmm. with the, with the way we've been, you know, with the lockdowns and, and whatnot. And the, as you were saying early in your presentation that the environment, if, if it's not, if it's stressful for either the humans or the animals, then we leave ourselves open to diseases as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it, so this environment would also be part of that, right? Like some ways, um, uh, Absolutely. coming up with ways to, to make sure our environment is uh, healthy and that climate mm -hmm. change isn't um, causing us uh, more uh, disasters and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy you mentioned that because our conversation so far has really been on the, the human animal component and we haven't really broached into the environment component, but I think you bring up an excellent point that that's a, a, a huge component when we think about prevention. If we look at a lot of those drivers that we know land use change, particularly like deforestation or urbanization um, and you know, um, land use change associated with agricultural intensification um, as well as climate change wildlife trade, those are all things that really involve the environment and are key drivers for disease emergence. And we, we continue to have examples where more disease emergence is associated with these land use changes and destruction, um, but I see it forgotten out of conversations a lot. Um, and so I think you bring up a good point and something that we can have on our key considerations for prevention is, we need to start building in that environmental sustainability and environmental health component into thinking about prevention um, because it's a really important part that just sometimes gets forgotten. But it is interesting to see how if we think about sort of, there's a lot of bad things that have happened because of the pandemic, but you're right, we've seen changes that have happened in the environment that are quite positive and and maybe another thing when we think about prevention is when can we reconsider some of our, you know, habits now that we see what sort of impact they have um, on the environment. And it's sort of like a win-win situation. Sam, you yeah. were going to say something. Sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. I just, um, I, I wanted to add to this amazing discussion some thoughts I had about sort of tying all of it together, you know, the comments on how uh, how do we make an impact as public health professionals? How do we sort of use the current pandemic as a learning opportunity? How do we link in animal welfare um, to all of this? And it and it's made me think about um, the social justice side as well. Mm. And and really um, the other thing that has emerged a lot with this pandemic is the um, it has just taken all of these inequities that we have and brought them all to the surface in a very obvious way. Um, but when we think back to Shannon's opening presentation, for example, um, how can we, how, how do we connect the dots between this, the social, the ecological um, interspecies justice? Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is a, you know, coming back to our roles, public health professionals, I really think a lot of it in this case is connecting the dots for people on some of these complex issues. Mm -hmm. um, I've put a lot of thought into, you know, how do we um, bring animals, like as a vet, how do we bring animals um, up to a level where they're, uh, they're, they're not just seen as commodities? Um, mm -hmm. I think that was a really great way to, to um, word that like we treat them as commodities now even as companion animals you know mm -hmm. they're commodities um, I think there's a lot of uh, oh okay we have five minutes left I'll try to summarize uh, we there, there's a lot of power in legislation in setting the tone for how animals are treated and when we improve our animal welfare laws we improve our economic system um, when we uh, look at things like, um, like free trade uh, and connect the dots on how free trade not only increases uh, climate change with greenhouse gas emissions, 
it, it drives, um, it drives this intensification of agriculture. Um, and when we think about uh, free trade as a, as a social issue, um, it means that we get cheap goods and that includes um, animals for food from other countries, um, but at what cost? Because uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch and somebody's paying for it somewhere and it's usually with um, uh, inappropriately paid labor and at the cost of the environment. Um, and so when we start to think about Trevor's comments about how it's high income people in high income countries uh, that are driving this, but it's low income people in low income countries that are paying the consequences for it. Um, I, I think it, it, it all loops back to, it, you know, it's, it's not necessarily as simple as saying, um, uh, is saying we need to treat animals better. It's <laughs> let's look at our entire system mm -hmm. and how uh, essentially capitalism has driven all of this. But imagine if we had a system where, um, you know, people had equal access to social assistance, uh, to health care that they needed, to economic opportunities, um, and it wasn't done at the expense of animals or the environment. Um, now we're talking about a society that's healthier, um, less prone to pandemics, and um, and is more equitable and just and sustainable. So um, I don't know if that, sorry, I, I'm not very good at articulating all of these thoughts and tying it all together, but uh, those were some of the connections I've seen coming out of this. And I think, um, you know, as public health professionals, we need to take every opportunity we can to highlight these even, even when we can't act on it in our work. Um, and then advocacy, uh, recognizing that advocacy is a huge role of public health. Um, and I stopped, how, sorry, I stopped sharing my screen if you wanted to put up the sort of summary the points. Slides, sure. Okay. I, I thought you came up with a really interesting thing that tied a few things together when you said that as public health professionals, because that sort of relates back to the question, one of your key responsibilities is communicating those intersections to the public. And I think, you know, these can be really complex issues that are hard for anyone to understand. But if you don't have the background to really, you know, read the literature and, and you know, do mm -hmm. all those things and, and be privy to those sort of conversations and environment, that can be really overwhelming. And, you know, if, if you don't have the ability or the, the information isn't communicated to you to understand sort of that complexity and some of those interconnections, um, then that's not, you, you can't act on that because that's not part of your, your knowledge base. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have anything to add? We have, Oh, 30 seconds left. <laughs> Let me think of one more point. Maybe something about that was brought up about the environment that um, consideration of environmental sustainability needs to be part of our pandemic conversations or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't word it as eloquently as the participant did. I think it's also about the, it's Cheryl here, the hierarchy of, of humans over everything. Mm. Unless that shifts, mm -hmm. we're only going to be saying, well, we need to do this with animals because it affects humans. We need to do this with, with water and, and soil because it affects humans. And that doesn't shift anything then. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was going to say earlier too, that we need to have a pass a policy which blows my mind that animals are sentient beings until there is a policy a top-down thou shalt policy people will still suggest that they're not sentient and therefore you know believe in the means to an end or whatever so 
-hmm. And I think that's the key where legislation can really come in, shift that whole culture. Mm -hmm. And and that, you know, relates to um, like environmental factors too, right? Like the, the, maybe rights of the environment isn't the correct term, um, 